Hi, Bill Mobley. Greetings from the Brain Channel. I'm here today with Ralph Greenspan. Ralph is professor in the Division of Biology in the section of Neurobiology here at UCSD and has been here at UCSD for the past seven years. Ralph has pursued a very distinguished career. His goal is to understand how the brain really works at the cellular and molecular level. And so I'm pleased to have you with me, Ralph. Happy to be here. Tell us about you, your training, your background, and, and what's exciting you right now. Well, my area of research from the time I was a graduate student has been in how genes uh, affect the brain and behavior um, in the fruit fly Drosophila, uh, which has been one of the workhorses of experimental biology for a century now. And, and really, it's a platform that has allowed us to learn so much about genes and the nervous system and even diseases of the nervous system. Yes, because it allows you to go very deep into the basic mechanisms, which turn out to have a great deal more relevance to humans than we ever imagined when we all started. You're still working in the fly? Yes. What's going on in the lab now with the fly? Well, the latest, the most recent kinds of things we've been doing um, in line with the goals of the Brain Initiative um, are doing whole brain recordings from the fly at high resolution in real time uh, at the level of the activity of nerve cells to see sort of what is what does a whole brain image of activity look like when the fly does various things. You know I've seen these movies and, and, and one is literally able to watch a fly's brain work while the fly is moving about. That was something we developed in my lab. Phenomenally interesting and, and so What's the goal there? What do you hope to see in those studies? Well, the idea is that basic mechanisms uh, in biology have universal application um, and are the road to medical advances. The major medical advances in the world have come from major scientific breakthroughs, and the greatest scientific breakthroughs have always come from studying very basic mechanisms, Right. even if you didn't know how they were going to be applied later on. So one builds then the scientific database, really, in a way, from the bottom up. That's right. That's exciting. Uh, now, I know that the work has moved not just deeply in your lab toward understanding the way neurons are connected, but it's moved to a different level, a level in which you've had really a very important scientific voice in crafting really the national effort and certainly the California effort in understanding the brain. The Brain Initiative is a word you use. Can you tell us about the Brain Initiative? The Brain Initiative grew out of a proposal that I and, and five other scientists made in uh, 2011 um, to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, who were interested in doing um, large-scale uh, sort of groundbreaking types of projects. And we proposed this to them and they liked it and over a period of a couple of years it grew into what became the Brain Initiative which was finally announced in I think 2013 was the year that it was started. What did your letter say? What did you propose? We proposed to do a full brain scale activity map of what goes on in the brain as we do various things, making the point that new, you know, technological breakthroughs are what was needed to be able to get to the point where we could do that, and that our ability to understand and treat diseases of the brain was severely hampered by not being able to do that, and that the only road towards being able to achieve that goal was to develop new technologies so that we could see better what the brain is doing. You know, when, when I was training, and I'm sure when you were training, the goal was to have the ability to m listen to one neuron with an electrode very carefully mm -hmm. over time, and, and that was difficult. Mm -hmm. But this initiative is asking the question, how do I record from 100,000 neurons? Or, or even more. Or even more, and understand something about their firing pattern relative to what they're doing, what the behavior might be. That's a huge technological challenge. It is a big challenge, and we don't currently see how to do it, and that's why the programs aimed at developing those technologies are, at this point, fairly open-ended in terms of soliciting you know, brave new ideas to try out, and uh, that's been what has driven them so far. Is there progress in the Brain Initiative? Is this investment, the public investment, yielding important new insights? Well, so far it has actually developed, it, it's resulted in the development of some very important new technologies for seeing into the brain 
and for being able to gently and subtly manipulate the activities of the brain in a therapeutic way. Can you think ahead, if you will, maybe 10 years or maybe 20 years, what do you think the initiative will bring forward? What will we be able to do in 20 years that we can't do now? For one thing, and one of the main goals of many of the projects, is we'll be able to see very early the first traces of uh, defects, diseases, effects in the brain, um, which for especially things like degenerative diseases are going to be critical in being able to halt the progression of the, of the disease. Sounds right. You know, for our listeners, um, it's very clear that the time to intervene in a disorder uh, is before it really happens. Maybe at the earliest warning sign of that, of a change in brain function. And why? The presumption is that that's the time when your therapies are most likely to be effective. Yes. So the Brain Initiative is maybe going to give us this window into those early warning signs that we need very much. That's certainly one of the main things that I think is quite likely to come out of it. Mm. The other sort of thing which is a bit more of a challenge is interventions that will treat the disorders as they occur and as they progress to try to correct them. And this will require us to understand much better the strategies and mechanisms that the brain uses to bring about the things that we do so that we can apply techniques to, to ameliorate them and to in a sense, mimic them and maybe supply them artificially, as is now being done in some studies, like there's a project going on for making memory prostheses, in a way, hmm. to sort of a, an external device that, that would record brain waves in such a fashion as to help spur the retrieval of memories from people. That's very amazing. I mean, the, the idea that one could know the brain so well that one could learn how to trigger uh, difficult to remember memories is exciting. So one of the thoughts that one has is that, so if a process occurs and there's a fault, in other words, that neuron A doesn't talk to neuron B correctly, one could measure that. But I think what you're suggesting is that the brain changes over time such that when neuron A doesn't speak quite correctly to neuron B, maybe other neurons get in the process and, and you could perhaps look at changes in those neurons or in those circuits to kind of detect there's a problem and here's how we might treat it. Well, that's in line with the discoveries that have been made over the past couple of decades showing just how plastic and changeable the brain is and how changeable it remains all through life. It's not just in, in the young and it's not just in the early stages, but what has been shown is that we, have, we retain a great deal more plasticity throughout life than, has ever, than was ever suspected, which is particularly important for things like stroke recovery. Yeah. Uh, other guests have spoken about plasticity. I guess we could just say plasticity was the ability of the brain to remodel itself in such a way to be able to adjust to changes in the environment. And some of those changes in environment could be ongoing disease processes. So this work under the Brain Initiative is critical for us to understand really ourselves, our own brains. There's a local California effort that you also spearheaded. Yes, it's called CalBrain, and it was started uh, two years ago um, by Governor Brown as part of a, a new initiative for having California's talent in innovation and development of new approaches to uh, scientific problems and, and medical problems to come to the fore. And it was funded back then with a small amount. And uh, this year it's back up again for consideration to become um, a more permanent program in the state. Does it modify, complement the Brain Initiative nationally? What does CalBrain do? It's a state version of what the Brain Initiative does. It supports innovative research projects in technologies for better understanding and seeing into the brain. Great. And treating what goes wrong in the brain. Again, the Brain Initiative and CalBrain right now are mostly at the stage of inventing new technologies, yes. innovating new ways of looking at the brain. Right. Exploratory. Exploratory. Can you, it's going to take years, I guess, for this to really deliver the tools we need to understand everything we need to understand about the brain. For the most difficult problems, that's certainly true. 
The earliest kinds of benefits that will come from it, though, some of which are close to being usable now, are improved techniques of how to detect in brain images that we already know how to do, like PET scanning, um, more specific things than just gross appearance of the tissue. There's now a new technique that's being developed as part of CalBrain project for being able to see inflammation in the brain immediately after it, it arises, which would be very important for traumatic brain injury, for example, and also for um, diseases like multiple sclerosis and other things that involve inflammation in the brain. And we know inflammation now plays a role in these degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Huntington's right. and, it's part of the and early, Parkinson's. It's part of the ability to detect them very, very early. So even though the fundamental premise is we're going to develop all these technologies for basic looking at the brain, basically understanding the nuts and bolts of brain function, the reality is there's already spinoffs that are very likely to be used by physicians, clinicians, to understand what happened after you had head trauma or what happened, where, where does inflammation uh, stand in the scheme of things for your Alzheimer's disease? Well, I think it's, a, it's a likely to be a very good early indicator of it and therefore a good way of monitoring if treatments are effective um, as people try various different approaches to new treatments, which are sorely needed for Alzheimer's, as you know very well. Very well know that, and, and a number of our programs have spoken to the real challenges that Alzheimer's disease presents. Ralph, with so much going on nationally under the BRAIN Initiative, Tell us what's going on here in San Diego. Well, we, as, as the institution that actually start, helped to start the BRAIN Initiative, we also developed, started the first um, academic organization at the university to coordinate the research in that area called the Center for Brain Activity Mapping, which the chancellor was very enthusiastic, Chancellor Kosla, from the moment that the BRAIN Initiative was announced, he wanted to be on board with it and he has supported us very well for getting started in that and has been an advocate for us uh, in the uh, state and uh, national arena. So do you have research proposals that you review and fund under so-called CBAM? Yes. Yeah. The chancellor gave us an allocation, a generous allocation um, at the start, which we were able to use to support some 20 small seed grants for people to do exploratory work uh, in two successive years. Um, and those have yielded very well in terms of allowing those investigators to go on and get larger scale funding for their projects. Uh, we have many examples now where people have gone from what was a seed grant of 30 or 50,000 to getting a huge, you know, multi-million dollar. It's now up to about 15 million so far hmm. in grant funds that are coming into the university under projects that were started with seed funding from CBAM. So a little bit of funding helping scientists get their, their preliminary data together really yields a huge rewards. It's phenomenally effective, and that's been the principle that we've operated on, uh, which is one that was started by our Kavli Institute for Brain and Mind um, when it began. So that's been our strategy all along, is seeding projects that were exploratory, that people couldn't get the money to do any other way. And it would be just enough to get them over the hump so they could come back and apply for something more substantial. And it's, it's such a useful tool in a community like ours where there's so much neuroscience going on, really at every level from gene to, to sort of brain function. So yes. this was a fertile right. ground in which to plant those seeds. We were ideally su suited for it because we have great engineering and computer science and great neuroscience. And what our task was, which we started doing from the outset, is getting those groups of people together to talk about ideas and to hatch out some new ones. And that's all come out of it very effectively. Did you find that there was a lot of enthusiasm for working together? Tremendous enthusiasm. It was, it was amazing to me. It was as if everybody was waiting all along for this to happen. Mm -hmm. The, the engineers were looking for applications that they thought would be effective and exciting, and the neuroscientists were anxious to be able to develop new techniques because they knew what the problems were that they wanted to solve, but didn't know how to solve them. So a great success story, and one that's continuing. That's right. Yes, absolutely. As you think of the next 
10 years in your own work, Ralph, where will it go? What do you want to achieve? My dream would be to use our ability now to look at the wholesale patterns of activity in the brain under different sort of activities that the animal is doing as a way of extracting whether there are any true underlying principles to the way the brain functions as a large network because that's part of what makes it such a challenge. It's not unlike the challenge of understanding a genome when we could first understand the sequence of an individual gene and what that gene makes and now we're trying to look at what the large-scale aggregate of all the genes in the genome mean and how to interpret what they do. The going from single neurons to the whole brain is somewhat analogous to that. Mm. And yet the complexities are there because whereas DNA is a linear sequence, we've got a brain that is at least three-dimensionally uh, complex right. and uh, as we mentioned, changes in time in response to environmental that's cues. constantly learning. changing, that's yeah. right. That's a, it is a major challenge for uh, it, it, it can be harnessed in the treatment of the brain, but it's a major challenge for being able to track what's going on because it's always changing. We thank you for your work. We thank you for being on the program. Best wishes going forward, Ralph. Well, thank you very much for having me. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.